Okay, I think we've had a bit of a pause of people trickling in. So we can go ahead and get started. Hi everybody, and welcome to Accessibility Basics, Google Tools, Best Practices, and Need to Knows course. My name is Lindsay Joseph, and I'm the Digital Accessibility Specialist in the Executive Director's Office for the Colorado Department of Public Safety, or CDPS for short. For your awareness, this session is being recorded and will be posted as part of this course in the Saba training platform in the next one to two weeks. In case you want to follow along now, the slide deck is in the chat. And for your reference, the link to, to today's demonstration Google Doc is also in the chat. That won't be relevant yet, but we'll start working on it shortly. A few norms before we get started. First, so you're aware, any of our participants using assistive technologies will have the live chats and reactions read to them as they come in. So this is just a friendly reminder to be aware of when and what you're posting in the chat during the training. Next, I want to make you aware of the closed captioning feature on the bottom toolbar of your screen, which you can toggle on and off if you want to see captions. And finally, if you have questions during the presentation, please raise your virtual hand. We'll keep an eye on the queue to facilitate who's next to speak. And when it's your turn, we would love for you to state your name and the agency you're with. Today's session is meant to be a broad overview of how to make Google content more accessible. It was designed with CDPS employees in mind. However, this content applies really to any state employees who create, edit, own, or distribute information using the Google platform. Our agenda is going to start with a brief overview of why we're learning about digital accessibility. Then I'll outline some commonalities that Google Docs, Slides, and Sheets all share. I'll then demonstrate steps you can take to make your Google content more accessible. And finally, at the end of our session, I'll share a list of related trainings and resources with you and leave the rest of our time open for your questions. You may have noticed there are some Google tools that we are not covering today. We will not focus on Google Sheets today, mainly because it's not as commonly used as these other tools. But because it's another authoring tool used in the Google platform, we've provided some extra slide content with general best practices for creating accessible Google Sheets. Those slides are hidden from today's presentation, but they're viewable if you open the slide deck yourself. Finally, we will not cover Google Meet at all today. Since that's a video communication service and not an authoring tool, the accessibility practices you'd want to focus on are pretty different from the ones we want to show you today. First, what is this about and why? As many of you know, House Bill 211110 is Colorado's new accessibility law that goes into effect on July 1st of this year. The law applies to all Colorado government entities and mandates that all of our digital content, like websites, electronic documents, and applications, need to comply with state accessibility standards. Beginning July 1st, noncompliance with the House Bill could result in monetary damages. But consequences aside, the passage of this House bill shows how important it is that everyone in society have equal access to the resources and services they need, especially those that are online. And in CDPS, that means that our ability to deliver critical public safety services, many of which are electronic, depends on whether people internal and external to our organization can access our digital content to begin with. Something we hope you take away from today is that accessibility practices not only improve accessibility, but they're just good design practices that make your content more usable for everyone. One example is using accessible document structure, like built-in heading styles, to organize your document into sections and subsections. It allows your users to quickly navigate to the content that they need. And this slide is just a reminder that digital accessibility doesn't only benefit screen reader users, but also people using other technologies like screen magnification, braille embossers, and speech recognition software. And keep in mind that some of these technologies are so helpful that they're commonly used by lots of people because they're useful for lots of different needs. Text-to-speech software, for example, is widely used assistive technology that allows someone with a reading disability to read digital content but also a convenient option for people who prefer to have their content read to them, whether that's an ebook, a document, either emails or something else. 
Starting off with Google Docs, Slides, and Sheets, I wanted to share some features that these authoring tools all have in common. Please keep in mind, the rest of the slide deck has lots of great information about Google tools, but we've skipped many of those slides for today's presentation. Our hope is that you'll reference the slide deck after the course to find more detailed guidance on the accessibility techniques that you'll see today. I will spend most of this course actually demonstrating techniques for you and answering your questions. So for the slides that I am presenting, I won't talk about them in great detail. First, are Google Files accessible document formats? And the answer is somewhat, but with some difficulties. Good news is that Google Docs, Slides, and Sheets offer lots of built-in tools that let you format for accessibility. So when you're ready to share content, for example, you can use their publish to web feature, which turns your content into a single scrollable HTML page that will display better on a mobile device and will be much easier to read for assistive technology users. On the other hand, Google Docs, Slides, and Sheets lack some important accessibility functions. For example, they don't have a built-in accessibility checker, and there'll be more on that later. Uh, you also can't convert Google Files to accessible PDFs because the conversion process itself strips the accessibility features that you might have added. So just keep these in mind when you create content in Google so that you can be aware of these gaps and other ways that you can address them. For the most part, if you create content in Google, it's usually better to download it as a Microsoft Office file if you plan on sharing it publicly. This is because you can use Microsoft's Accessibility Checker to find issues and make changes, and if needed, convert your Microsoft file to an accessible PDF. Moving on to templates, you can make your own with just about any authoring tool, including Google Tools. So this is a reminder that templates are a great way to save you time when you're making content. If there's a common document format you use a lot in your work or one that your agency uses a lot, then creating an accessible template is a great way to make sure your content has some basic accessibility formatting every time. Now I'll move into the demonstration portion of our training. Again, the demonstration Google Doc I'm using is linked in the chat. If you want to follow along with me, um, click the link and make your own copy so that your edits don't end up on the original. I'll show you how to do this, um, but you can make a copy by opening the Google Doc going to File in the upper menu bar, and then select Make a Copy. And as a reminder, I'll be showing you some actual steps you can take to improve accessibility of your Google Docs, Google Slides, and emails. Starting with Google Docs, which is by far the most used Google tool in CDPS, I'll show you some steps you can take to make your content more accessible and more readable for your audience. Most of today's demonstration will be in Google Docs, since a lot of these strategies are done in similar ways, no matter what Google tool you're using. Today, in the Google Doc, I'll show you how to create accessible headings, spacing, hyperlink text, alternative text, and color contrast. And for future reference, this Google Doc also has written instructions for how to perform each of these techniques yourself, plus some practice examples and other helpful tips. So let's go ahead and open the Google Doc. So this is the demo Google Doc that we're supposed to make a copy of. So like I said, you'll go to File, click Make a Copy, save it wherever you like in your Google Drive, and your copy will open. There we go. All right. We're gonna start with the heading section. I'm just gonna scroll down to the practice area since that's where we'll be focusing today. So I have our demonstration Google Doc open and I'll start by showing you how to apply built-in headings. First, a few tips for applying heading styles in Google Docs. Avoid using Google's title and subtitle headings since they're not universally recognized headings. Instead, Start with a standard heading one for your title, heading two for major sections, heading three for smaller subsections, and so on. And a quick trick, in case you haven't seen this before, if you've already applied heading styles in your Google Doc, you can open the document outline on the left side of your screen, which shows you how your headings form an outline. So to see the document outline, you can either, <coughs> excuse me, 
uh, click the document outline icon at the top left of the document, which I'm hovering my mouse over now, or in the upper menu bar, you can go to the view menu and select show outline, which I'm hovering over right now with my mouse. I usually click the document icon, so I'm going to click that. Now let's look at the practice example on our screen. It says we need to apply heading styles to the main title of this document, the major section called headings that we're currently in, and it's three smaller subsections. So starting with the main title, let's scroll up to the main title. We're going to highlight that text, demo for Google Docs accessibility. Make sure the font, text color, and size for the title are how you want them to look. And then in the upper toolbar, open the styles drop-down menu. It currently says normal text right now. In the Styles drop-down, scroll to the heading level you need, which is Heading 1 for the main title, and we're going to select Update Heading 1 to match. Now what that does is you've just made your own customized Heading Level 1, rather than having to use Google's preset style. Next, we're going to repeat this for the other heading levels that we need to add. So now we'll go down to our next heading, which visually I can see is headings. So now I'll highlight that section title. I have it styled how I want it to look. So I will open the styles drop down again. Because this is a major section, it should be heading level two. So scroll down to that and select update heading two to match. And again, now you have created your own custom heading level two. You don't have to use the preset Google style. Finally, I'll apply headings to each smaller subsection within this heading section that we're in. We have three of them. Uh, so let's highlight our first subsection here. I have it styled how I want it to look. So I will open the styles menu and select heading three. What we're going to do is go to update heading three to match. And we're gonna call this heading three because it is a smaller subsection of heading two that we just created. Update heading three, we now have our heading three set up. For the remaining two subsections, we're going to highlight that text, open the style menu, since we've already set up what we want Heading 3 to look like, we can just click Heading 3 and the highlighted text should update to match the style that you created. And the same would go for other tips subsection, we would do it the same way. And that's how you create headings in Google Docs. So we're gonna make our way down to the spacing section now and talk about line and paragraph spacing. So, one tip for adjusting line and paragraph spacing is it's probably habit for most of us to press the enter key to create space in a document. But as natural as it might feel to do this, it creates a really unnatural and disruptive reading experience for someone using assistive technology. Let's say you press the enter key three times to make space between two sections in your document. Assistive technology is going to read this as blank, 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 and then continue reading whatever content follows. So instead, I'll show you how to adjust spacing with our practice example here. Um, again, we're now in the spacing section of this document. And for this practice example, we need to find out where spacing was simulated using the Enter key. Especially for shorter blocks of text, I personally find it easiest to use the down arrow key and go line by line to find the blank lines. Um, but for a longer document, it can help to go to view in the upper menu bar and then select show non-printing characters. This lets you see all the times that you've pressed the enter key to create space because blank lines are going to be marked with a, the paragraph symbol, which looks like a backwards P. You can actually see them above and below this practice heading. So clearly the enter key was used instead of the spacing tool. So let's see here. Um, now that we've found all the simulated space, which again, you can see with these paragraph symbols, the backwards P's, 
I'm going to remove them. I'm just going to do one today for the sake of time. Let's use the spacing heading as our example. Um, I'm going to delete this space underneath it because it wasn't created correctly. So we'll remove that. Um, I've deleted my simulated space, and in its place, I'm going to use Google Docs line and paragraph spacing tool. So first, I'm going to highlight the line of text that I want to change spacing for. I can also just click so that my cursor is somewhere in this line of text that I want to change. So I'll show you that as well. Um, and then in the upper toolbar, you're going to select the line and paragraph spacing icon. It looks like a double arrow pointing up and down, and I have my mouse hovering over it right now. So let's click on that. I want to select add space after paragraph, meaning I want to add space between this heading and the content that starts below it. We'll select add space after paragraph. If I don't like the amount of space that Google's preset functions add, I can customize how much space I want things by going back to the spacing tool and selecting custom spacing. Before I move on, I think I heard a hand go up. Hey, yeah, it's Ingrid. I'm sorry to be a goober on this. How no, do you please. get, how do you get the, I mean, so what you're saying is the little blue paragraph symbols show that it's not appropriately accessible. Is that what you're saying? The little blue paragraph symbol is just going to show you that you've pressed enter to create right. space, which is something that you want to avoid. So it's just sort of a visual cue. If you're scanning your document, you can okay. know kind of right away that the blank spaces were created in a way that isn't the most accessible. Okay, it's not a it's not a death knell for accessibility, but it's not no. the best practice. Okay, right, Thank exactly. You. Yeah, we're we're just here to try and make documents easier for people to read. So it's not you know, the end all be all of accessibility, but it's something that is really helpful to just make it more usable. Great question. Um, so what I was going to quickly show you is if I don't like the amount of spacing that Google's preset functions create, I can just go back into this spacing menu, go to custom spacing, and I can just experiment with different numbers to get the amount of spacing that I want. I want more space after the heading. So what I'll do is just, it's kind of arbitrary, but I'm going to change this number. It says right now the spacing after is 10. I'm going to change it to 20 because I want it to be more. So we'll apply that. That looks good to me. And that is how you use the spacing tool. I'm going to just go back to view and deselect the non-printing characters so that we can move on to our next technique here. Moving into hyperlinks. Um, now I'll show you out how to add a descriptive hyperlink. A few tips for creating them. Hyperlink text should give clear and accurate information about where a link will take you. And hyperlink text should make sense even if it's taken out of context from the surrounding text. So avoid vague link text like click here and read more since they don't tell you anything about where the link is going to bring you. So let's look at the practice example. I'm going to create a descriptive hyperlink from one of, the, of these raw links. So let's just use the first one, which I actually already have open. I'm following the link to see where it takes me so that I can make sure to describe it accurately in my hyperlink text. And more often than not, the title of the linked page works well for hyperlink text, as long as that title gives you an idea of the content that follows. So that's what I'm going to do. Going back to our document, I'm going to highlight the full link here, right click the highlighted text and select insert link. So you see Google recognized this as a link right away. So it automatically just turned this text into a link. That's fine. Just right click the link again. And instead now we'll have an option to edit the link. So we'll select edit link. And you should see two fields pop up here that you can edit. The top field is the hyperlink text that will display in your document. And the lower field is the actual raw link. 
So in the top field, enter the hyperlink text that you want displayed. I want to use the title of this web page, which is how to colon accessible website content. And then select apply. And that is how you add hyperlink text in Google Docs. Next, I am going to show you um, how to add an image description. Um, gonna, Lindsay, oh, we yeah. had a question in the chat before you yeah. go on. And sure. actually, Sarah, you read my mind there too. So mm -hmm. Sarah is asking, can you share with folks how this page is read using a screen reader extension? I'm not sure a lot of people actually know how it is read. And going back to Lindsay's example of the URL, the reason mm -hmm. why we're pushing for this, that you put in descriptive text instead of the entire URL, is because the screen reader is going to read that letter by letter, which is a torture to hear, which is like mm -hmm. HTTPS, you know, colon, so on and so forth. So you can imagine how that will sound. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of a nightmare. And the reason the hyperlink text is also extremely helpful is that a screen reader user can select to just pull up all the links in a document at once and kind of scan around that way. So if it's just a bunch of read this and click here and see more, they're not gonna know what any of that is. So that's why it's really important that taken out of context, that link makes sense and tells someone where it's going. Thank you for asking that. I think that's a really important thing to cover that I missed. Um. Any other questions about hyperlink text before I talk about alt text? And Lindsay, I don't know if you have a screen reader extension on right now, uh, but I know that we have recorded like a snippet of it, like what it would actually sound like. And I'll see if mm -hmm. I can find that file and try to put it in the chat, okay? Oh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. And we can add it to our resources section too in the slide deck. Um. Okay, so we'll move on to alt text. Um, a few tips for writing alt text. It should be no longer than 125 to 150 characters. This is because assistive technologies will only read about that much alt text before cutting it off with some variation depending on which technology someone's using. Alt text is meant to be an image replacement that explains what you want the image to convey in the context of your document. And finally, whether it's due to a disability or because the images just won't load on the page, for people who can't see your images, they're going to rely on alt text to understand the important information that those images were meant to convey. So let's look at the practice example. It says, since alt text is context dependent, here are some alt text examples that would vary based on what your document is about. Pick one version of alt text and add it to the image below. And since we're not focusing on how to write alt text today, just how to add it, I'm just going to pick one of these text examples at random, and we'll use that as our alt text. So to add the alt text, you're going to find your image, right-click, select alt text. Oh, whoops. You're not supposed to see that. It's blank. Um, <laughs> so you'll see the alt text field appear. Google sometimes gives the option to enter an alt text title and an alt text description. This is not what you're seeing on my screen, but just because I've seen it before, if you're given those two fields, a title field and a description field, just make sure to leave the title field blank since this is not a standard alt text field. Instead, alt text always goes in the description field. Um, and then when you're done, you can close this larger image options menu that appeared to put in the alt text, and it will save your alt text that way. So close that up. Uh, before I move on, was there a question in the chat that we should address right now? Um, no, Lindsay, I tried to put in the sample recording. Um, hopefully people can access it, but if they can, I'll try to find a workaround. Okay, and we can and make a note. I might have some additional resources for that too. Okay, and then Sarah did mention, I also want to make sure that we at DCJ are using the same resources, same extensions, so we can claim the same reasonable effort. So we can definitely find resources for screen reader extensions for you, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Um, so our last technique I'm going to demonstrate for you is checking color contrast. I'm just going to zoom in a bit since there's a little more hands-on stuff that goes on with checking color contrast. Um, a few tips for checking color contrast. This is how well the foreground color stands out from the background color, and that's expressed in a color contrast ratio. And for state agencies to be in compliance for accessibility, color contrast ratios for digital text and graphics need to meet success criteria that are outlined in the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, also known as WCAG, specifically conformance level AA, which is more or less considered mid-level conformance. A being the lowest, AA being middle, AAA being highest, which is not what we need to be compliant at the state level. So let's look at the practice example. I'm going to check one of these text colors to see how well it stands out against the white background and whether the contrast ratio meets WCAG AA criteria. Now there are different tools out there to check color contrast ratios and today we'll be using WebAIM's color contrast checking tool. It's a web-based tool that you can use in your internet browser and it's also recommended by OIT. So I've got that open. Let's expand it a bit so you can see. So I now have the color contrast tool open in my Google Chrome browser. For the color combination that you need to check, there's one area to enter the foreground color and another area to enter the background color. I'll get the demo document and the color contrast checker up on the screen for you so that you can see what I'm about to do here. And so, uh, Lindsay, while oh, you're yeah. doing that, uh, mm -hmm. one quick question in the chat from Kelly. Yeah. Uh, I may have missed this, but how do we access this recording in the future? Uh, I'm uh, assuming you're access you're talking about the recording of this uh, entire training, right, Kelly? Uh, and we will be putting that up as part of the Saba course. So the recording will be part of that course, and we'll share the link to that in the end. There might be a little bit of a delay getting the recording out just because we'll need to check um, the transcript and just make sure it's accurate, but we'll right. make sure that's up in the next roughly one to two weeks in the Saba course. Okay. Are you okay to take one question from Sarah, Lindsay? Yeah, of course. Go for it, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Lindsay. Um, I just, I know I brought it up before at these trainings, but I want to say it one more time. If this is going to be available in Saba, why is it not required? Um, for all staff to take this, because I do think these basics are really, really important, especially for staff in my current unit. Um, mm -hmm. It just, it seems to fall a lot on the admins to double check these things. And we've said, even in your other training, that this kind of starts at inception. It's easiest mm -hmm. to make sure that it's accessible from the beginning. So I just want to advocate again, please make this required, because I can't do it all. <laughs> So really that's loud and clear. To, Go ahead, Corey. It's up to divisions to make it required or not. Not every single employee is doing documents. Um, you can imagine troopers, you know, they have a lot less interaction with documents and things of this nature. So we left it up to divisions. So that's why EDO is not making it mandatory. It's really up to the divisions and the supervisors to make that call. Okay. And we'll make sure that these trainings are easy to find in Saba. I think every single one starts with the title CDPS accessibility. And you can also filter by category accessibility so that if you want to collect, you know, everything accessibility related to make some or all of them required, that's probably going to be the best way to find everything you need. And one more quick note. I know, Carolyn, you mentioned that the link sometimes shows up on the meeting calendar. Um, the one we will upload on Saba will be uh, through YouTube so that anyone who needs to put on subtitles or captions on, then they have that uh, capability. So uh, just a quick note on that. So that's why it may take us a little bit of time to upload the recordings. Thank you. Um, all right. I will continue on with our color contrast checking journey. Um, to put your colors into this checker, the WebAIM tool gives you the option to enter the color's numerical hex value or to find the color using their color picker. 
I never use the hex value field. I find it really tedious and I don't totally get it. So we're gonna go into the color picker. I want to make sure that I pull the exact color that I used in my document. So I recommend using the eyedropper tool in the color picker. It looks like an eyedropper icon and I have my mouse circling around it in case that helps a little bit to find it. Now I'm going to check my red font color against the white background. My text color is the foreground and we have the foreground color picking tool open already. So when I select the eyedropper tool, a circle with a target in the center appears. I'm going to use my mouse to hover over one of my red letters. Ooh, there we go. Until I get the target over one of the saturated areas of color. Then I'm going to click to set that color as the foreground in the contrast checker. So you can see now the color has updated to be that exact shade of red that I use in my document. Our background color is white, which is already selected by default in the color contrast checker since that is the most common background color. I checked ahead of time with the eyedropper and I confirmed that this is the exact shade of white in our document already. So we will just move on and not enter that in right now. But once the foreground and background colors are entered, the checker calculates the color contrast ratio, which appears just under the foreground and background fields we used. So it calculated a color contrast ratio of 3.99 to one. But what's even more helpful about this tool is that underneath the contrast ratio, the tool will tell you whether that ratio passes or fails WCAG AA criteria. Um, so this part of the checker is divided into three sections, normal text, large text, and graphics. And this is because WCAG has different contrast ratio criteria depending on which of these elements you're testing. For normal and large text, the tool provides examples uh, to show you what normal and large text can look like. So this is the normal text. I'm highlighting the large text now underneath it. The tool also defines these elements in writing right on their website for you. But for the sake of today's demonstration, I'll also tell you what these definitions are. So normal text is non-bolded text, size 14 or smaller. Large text is non-bolded text, size 18 or larger, or bolded text, size 14 or larger. And finally, graphics include any non-text content, like images, icons, and borders. I know that I used size 12 font in my document, so I'm going to focus on the results in the normal text section of the checker. The checker says that normal sized red text on a white background fails WCAG AA criteria. So I'll need to adjust the foreground or background colors to get the ratio that I need. And since I know I want to use a white background, I'm going to play with the foreground text color. I can do this in the checker's foreground field using their luminance slider until I reach a, a passing color contrast ratio. So I can just slide it down to make it darker. And you'll see this shade of red appears to pass WCAG AA standards for normal text. Um, another way you can find a more appropriate color is just going back to your document and experimenting with other text colors and then checking those color combinations again in the checker. And as another option, if using colored text is just for visual appeal, I might sacrifice color just to make sure that my document is more accessible and usable for my audience. And for the most part, the simpler you can make your documents, the fewer steps you'll need to take to make them accessible. And that really goes for any best practice we've gone through today, not just for color. So that's the end of our demonstration. I'm just gonna briefly bring us back to the slide deck and conclude with a few best practices for Google Slides and for Gmail. So let's open this back up here. Um, so Google Slides is another widely used tool in CDPS. There are a few best practices unique to Google Slides that I wanted to highlight for you. And for today, I'll focus on the topic of slide layouts and titles. 
as you create slides, make sure to use Google's built-in slide layouts rather than simulating your own. Also, whenever possible, use slide layouts that have a designated title field and a text field. This is because it's easier for users to follow the content of each slide and allows assistive technology users to tell the difference between slide titles and slide content. Um, Built-in layouts with titles and text fields also tell assistive technologies the correct order to read your content in. Uh, before I continue, I think I might have seen something pop up in the chat. Is that anything we should address right now, Labna? Uh, yeah, we got a question from Jay that um, what requirements and best practices are there while inserting videos into presentations that are not accessible? I will tell you I don't have the answer off the top of my head, but I can get you resources for it. <laughs> If, love now you don't mind taking a note down, and I'm, I'm more than happy to get some of that for you. Sorry, terrible answer. <laughs> um, any other questions along those lines of videos that I'm clearly a wealth of information for? Not in All the right. chat. Yeah. OK. Um, well, finishing up with this slide then, um, there's a screenshot here showing where to find the slide layouts that I'm referring to, as in the, those built-in slide layouts that are already in Google. The screenshot shows the upper toolbar in Google Sheets with the layout menu circled. The layout menu is selected and expanded to show the different slide layouts that you can choose from, just to give you an idea of where to find that in Google Slides. And finally, each slide needs to have its own unique title. This allows assistive technology users to better navigate your content because they will navigate it by slide titles. Unique slide titles also make it easier for all users to tell the difference between slides, and then it makes it easier to anticipate what content they're going to find there. And finally, we've reached Gmail. We all use it here in CDPS, and there are some best practices unique to Gmail that I wanted to highlight for you. Since there are a lot of best practices on these next two slides, I'll share the ones that we haven't already talked about or that are just specific to Gmail. So first, make sure your subject line is concise and summarizes the purpose of your email. And to make the body of your email easy to read, take steps like using black or dark gray font and using a text size that's large enough for most people to comfortably read. I believe I saw a question pop up in the chat. Anything we should address right now? Um, yeah, from Jason, how do we apply the color to be in compliance using that color tool? So that is something I tried to figure out. I am not certain of the method or whether a method exists to do that. I prefer to just play around with color in my authoring tool because I, right at this moment, I don't know a way to match that exact color. So I either just find something that looks similar in the place where I'm creating the document or I just get rid of color entirely. Um, also, Jason, are you talking more about branding guides? I guess I just wanted to know since we're, you, you, we have that on there, like, you know, um, if we don't want a, there to be an accessibility issue, is it just better to not use color or like, you know, when you do that on there, there's, there's no button that says like apply or find you know, the color that matches that in order for that to, you know, do what you need it to do. So I, I guess that's my point is like, yeah, you can use that to measure it, but like, how are you supposed to convert it to that? My you know, only for thought- the, For oh, the whole point of accessibility, you know? Yeah, so I think I misspoke. With the color, whatever color happens to meet the contrast ratio, it's a little bit technical, but because like I said, in that checker, you can input color by doing um, that hex numerical value. There's also another numerical way you can enter the color. So you can find the exact properties of that color, those numerical values, and you can usually enter those into your authoring tool and get that exact color. So it's not the smoothest way, but it is a way to do it and create that exact color. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Like, if you want to comply with branding guidelines, use that hex number, so then you'll get the exact match. Um, also, I do want to put in just one little note here. 
we're not saying that you avoid color entirely because we have to make sure that we're making uh, content for everyone, all users, right? And sometimes you do have to use color. Just use it appropriately, making sure, like uh, Lindsay explained, using that contrast feature, uh, and also ensure that you that color alone is not the only way that we are conveying meaning. So if you have another way that you are conveying the same information, um, that is also great for for um, um, users who cannot d distinguish between color contrast even, right? So um, so just bear that in mind. And the last thing I would add to that is in this slide deck, there are some more detailed slides that go into use of color and color contrast. So I would definitely check those out as well. And if you feel like you still need additional resources, just reach out to me or our team and I'm we're happy to provide more detailed information on that. Oh, another question. Um, I'm not able to see it. Lubna, would you mind reading it out? And I'm muted, so that doesn't help. <laughs> uh, so from Sarah, is there a list of resources for accessibility? Division department, wide screen reader, color checker. What accessibility checker are we using to produce materials? Grackle doesn't produce the same alert as Adobe or uh, Word. Corey, do you want to take that? Just because it's a bit more like overarching, I wonder if you have perspective on that. Yeah, so Sarah, we do have the accessibility page on the internet where we've been putting resources um, like this. Yeah. Um, so with, with Grackle, you know, that's something that we have to pay for. So mm -hmm. it's kind of, you know, there's some tools that are super helpful like WebAIM, um, some that are, you know, costly to use. So okay. uh, I'll just, check that one and I'm going to drop a link to it, but yeah, no, like master list of everything for the state or anything like that, I would say. Okay. Um, I was reading through the, the bill the other day. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what is being asked of me. And I was just, it seems mostly there has to be reasonable effort made. So that's why I just want to see if we're trying to be like consistent as a division or department um, that we're using those same resources because obviously I'm lucky and I have a Grackle profile, others do not. So maybe I should not be, I don't, I don't know what trumps the other. I just wanna make sure if we're producing something in a PDF, all I need to do is run it through the Adobe checker and I should claim that I did reasonable effort. I don't know. Um, I was just wondering if there is um, consistency throughout the division or department. Yeah. And oh, Chris no, no, no. just mentioned mm -hmm. that employee ex expectations will be in the accessibility policy coming in late spring as well. Thank you so much for Chris. Yes, we've been working hard on that. Um, I will go back to saying that a lot of this is best practices. Um, and Lindsay did a great presentation on the intro to PDF section as well, where she emphasized that yes running it through the checker for adobe is part of it but manual it comes down to manual testing as well so the more fluent you become um, it'll become easier for you to make more accessible documents and content um, mm -hmm. of course it's going to be a moving target and 100 percent compliance is going to be practically impossible right because the the guidelines are going to keep changing and we're going to be expecting more and more um, but uh, in the end, this is why we're doing the trainings is that this becomes um, daily practice more than just a one time thing, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, so definitely. I, I have to be honest, I'm not worried about myself <laughs> because I am doing all of these things. I've attended all of these trainings even before this. I thought it was an important aspect of the job. There are just 22 other people in my unit that have not been able to attend these trainings have this information. So it does come down to most of us admins from the conversations that I've had. So that's why I just want to make sure that we're at least a little bit consistent. Um, but I do know it's a moving target because um, you can't necessarily capture all um, limitations. So I just, I as things are found, if we could just share, 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 that would be really cool because and I would request of you if you can be like our chain champion and uh, you know say to others, hey, this is great training coming up. Why don't you? You attend? have no idea. 
because I, I really, I don't want this responsibility. I, uh, not just myself, but Courtney, she's also attending right now. Um, we are the people that our unit come to for answers and I do not know everything, but I have been really, really trying. So, um, Thank you. yeah, I just want to put it out there. Some consistency would be really cool. That's a fair ask. Um, I think at this point, since we close at 1030 on this, um, I don't have anything super novel to share with these slides. They're pretty spelled out. Um, basically just some things to keep in mind for those who can't see your emails. Um, try to use words instead of emojis so that someone's not missing out on the tone that you're trying to convey. Um, using bold text is fine if you want to emphasize text. Just know that a screen reader or a, other assistive technology won't necessarily tell the user, you know, hey, this is bold text, pay attention. So you might want to alert your users of something important coming up by saying important exclamation point in bold. Um, and finally, just a note that you, if you have any graphics in your emails, in the body of your email, make sure to add alt text. And if it's in the signature, if you're in your email signature, excuse me, add alt text to those as well. And please check out the slide deck, which will actually tell you how to add alt text in the email body and in your email signature. Um, we're wrapping up, so just a few housekeeping things. Make sure to register in Saba for this course if you haven't already. Take the short quiz so that you'll get some credit. Um, lastly, we have a lot of resources here. There are still more than this, if you can believe, but this is a lot of them. Different checklists, how-to guides, an accessible Google Doc template. Um, I have compiled some slide decks about Google tools specifically, um, some trainings, and then uh, tools that you can use to check the accessibility of your content. And a quick Grackle update um, for CDPS employees specifically. OIT has given us a blanket approval for CDPS to purchase Grackle licenses for individual employees as they request it from now through October 31st. Um, Grackle is an add-on automated accessibility checker for Google products, just as a reminder. Just important that you meet three conditions. You cannot have any access to CGIS data at all in your job. Your request needs to be emailed directly to and approved by Keegan Wilson and or Corey Niemeyer in EDO. I put their contact information in the speaker notes for you. Um, and finally, the request for the Graco license has to come in before October 31st, 2024. So now if there are other questions, we'd love to take them. And if you have questions in the future about making Google content accessible or other digital accessibility topics, feel free to reach us at the email on this screen, cdps underscore accessibility at state.co.us. And thanks for joining us. And we have a question from Sarah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I obviously um, care about this. Um, I was just wondering, I, I know we might be working on an internal checklist um, for like, hey, did you check all of these things before you produce the material? Um, mm -hmm. Is that something that EDO could potentially produce so that, again, there's like some s consistency throughout um, divisions and units? Uh, of course, we'll do it ourselves, but it would be cool if that was like put on the bathroom stall or something. <laughs> Are you talking um, about a checklist for documents? Mm -hmm. Because we do have one, and I think that's listed on one of uh, the resource slides that Lindsay shared. Oh, um, then maybe I did miss it. I'm like, it, before mm -hmm. you put this on the website, have you done all of these things? It, was it a list like that? Uh, not per se for, for websites, but it is for documents. I'm going to share that particular link here for okay. you. Just one second. I would also say, Sarah, if you can, send me an email. Um, and I think I might have a more targeted resource for you because I know okay. OIT is also trying to put stuff out yeah. to, within reason, allow divisions to be consistent, knowing that we all have really different functions. Yeah. But send me an email. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll um, Courtney and I will, will send you something because I, I think okay. Courtney's going to start working on something and it would be nice to have input from 
above. So thank you for that. Yes. OK, perfect. Yeah, do that. And Lindsay, real quick in, from the chat, Corey reminded mm -hmm. us there's an upcoming training uh, mm -hmm. for PDF and MS Word uh, training on March 18th at 1. Uh, Carolyn mentioned the bathroom stall notices need bigger fonts. Yes, they do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And then another one, do we have any awareness of any technological updates on the assistive technologies? They are great tools in the current state, yet I think some of the adaptations we need to make indicate that there is room for growth as well. I don't have updates right now about assistive technologies, but like you're alluding to, technology does change quickly, which means that accessibility needs are always going to be changing. We're never going to be 100% accessible, and part of that is because of the nature of technology. It's just something we're continually working towards, and there, frankly, will always be room for growth, which is why we're striving for prioritizing what matters most to make accessible and just using best practices. We can't necessarily tick a bunch of boxes and say we're 100%. We just have to be doing what we can to notice our audience's needs and make sure we're trying our best to meet those. Um, um, another question, will we have any CDPS training on how to make dashboards accessible? That's a big one. <laughs> it depends also what tools we are using to make the dashboards, because mm -hmm. there are some enterprise level tools that are uh, OIT, I believe, is working with um, vendors on. Um, there's nothing set in stone coming up. We're definitely open to ideas of what kinds of training people feel like they need. Um, I wonder, Corey or Lubna, does anything already exist along those I think, lines? I think we held off on doing complex images and charts just because it is a very complicated one. And we were also looking for guidance from OIT. And because vendors like Tableau, they're, they're still uh, getting up to speed on some of those uh, accessibility aspects. So we will definitely uh, review that and, and start creating something because it is definitely something we all need. I can't give you a timeline on when that will be done, though. Not for the foreseeable future, I'd say. Not, not in the immediate. And Gretchen, you have your hand up, too. Yeah, Lebanon, thank you so much. That was super helpful. I was just curious, because we've been working on some dashboards. And in my mind, I was just going to alt text. But hearing, I didn't realize that they only do, like, I don't remember what you said, maybe 250 characters. Basically, we have Twitter for alt text. It sounds like, um, yeah. and I don't know, maybe that's an outdated, besides the fact I used the wrong name for <laughs> the social media company. Um, I don't remember if they changed the character numbers, but now I feel like I have to go back and check my alt text to see, because I. And it's such a hard balance between making sure that the image is clear, but then having a character limitation, and that was what I had planned on doing and making the dashboards accessible. like can i link to a word document that has text then instead that describes maybe the dashboard okay exactly yes. and i would say gretchen i just um i actually just met with a group of folks to talk about this exact issue mm -hmm. if you don't mind sending me an email i can send those resources to you and the explanations of kind of what you can do instead it's basically it came down to a matter of is it simple enough that you can describe it in about 150 characters? And if not, you'll want to just link to a longer description and use your alt text to say, hey, here's the dashboard. You can find the longer description here. OK. Yeah, I think like some of it's interactive. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, like, for example, an exit survey, being able to click on a classification to see how those people have responded and it's trying to figure out, it's essentially it's like Tableau, how Lubno was talking about how Tableau mm -hmm. is, but this is on Looker Studio and I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not super afflu like fluent in it. So maybe I think it's the user knows that it's an inferior program, but it's also maybe it's just because I don't know what I'm doing entirely with it. And I'm like stumbling into answers. So I don't, you know, it's just, trying to figure out how we make it accessible. And I know people don't have to self-disclose, but like if we can put things on there, like contact Gretchen to walk you through, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. And, and um, real quick, short okay. answer. Sorry, Lindsay, I'm just jumping no, in. Please. So uh, for all your graphs or complex images, right? Like you mentioned, having that write-up is going to be key in explaining whatever 
that image is conveying or that graph is conveying. However, it is a lot of work because whatever data you're putting on there, you're trying to you know transfer that onto your Word doc as well. So we do understand there's a lot. So that's where accommodations uh, could come in into play as well. So when you are prioritizing what needs to get done first, so then maybe this is kind of like where you'll say, we can uh, uh, we can give you reasonable accommodations if someone needs to get on the phone with you and read this out, or if we need to present this in a um, in a Word doc or whatever. So we can make that happen. It might take a little bit of time. Also, just so you know, I just posted a link in the chat to an, a Looker Studio specific example of data visualization. This is something that OIT's accessibility team created. Um, to show a less accessible version and a more accessible version and why. Um, I would definitely encourage you all to check out that Empathy Lab um, site that they've created. They do the same kind of concept for forms. Here's a less accessible, here's a more accessible. Documents, here's a less accessible, more accessible, et cetera. Um, but just so you know, that is a resource as well. Any other burning questions? And if not, you can always find us in our office hours, Thursdays, 3.05 to 3.45, is that right? Yep. You can reach me personally. You can reach um, CDPS underscore accessibility. Um, but yeah, we're here, we're available and happy to help. Um, just let us know what questions you have later, if not right now. Ah, thanks, Corey. He just posted the link to um, office hours in the chat. Well, I have 30 people on the on the group right now. Just a quick plug. Since we are nearing that July 1st deadline, I would highly encourage everyone to just kind of start inventorying your documents, figuring out what you work with or your team works with, and then start going through and seeing uh, are those accessible or not? So just a quick plug there and reach uh, out to us. We can help um, with some templates on those inventories as well. Um, there's a question in the chat. Um, this recording is going to be put up in the Saba course for this training. Um, the link to the Saba course is in the slide deck. It's also in the chat. Just know it might take one to two weeks for us to get the actual recording up. And that's because we just need to check it for accessibility, make sure the transcripts are accurate and things like that. It will be a YouTube link ultimately. Yes, Helena, I'm going to post the link just, or did someone already do that? Wait, I will post it right now. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Coming your of way. Course. Way to out myself, but thank you. <laughs> hey, no problem. People have people have engagements. It's all good. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Well, if there are no other plugs and no other questions, then thank you guys so much for joining. We know this is a big lift, and we're so glad that you're invested and all doing it along with us. We're all doing it together. Have a great rest of your day.